Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here to talk about this um, exciting issue. Um, and I'm going to extend my remarks to talk a little bit about the relationship between state and municipal governments and pension reform and where does it stand. I'd like to highlight three states today that have both a state and a municipal pension challenge. Those include Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, and California. Uh, many of you, of course, are familiar with what's happened here in Rhode Island over the past um, years and months. Uh, I think your treasurer uh, did such a marvelous job because she, the way she framed the problem, the way she diagnosed the problem, uh, came up with a plan and then acted upon it, uh, that report was truth in numbers. And what she notes is it's a math problem. Um, she notes the effect also, there's a report on the uh, Rhode Island Treasury website of how you might look at Rhode Island's pension system using FASB rules. We just heard about the GASB rules in which state and local governments are valuing their pensions based on these ex high expected asset returns. FASB governs private sector pension plans. They have the logic a bit better. They are looking at that liability figure using the return on corporate bonds for, for private sector plans. So that report actually looks at Rhode Island state plans according to the current scenario, that 8%, 7.5% returns, and then takes it all the way down to this uh, FASB guidance, and, and it, it shows you that uh, the state plan under GASB is $4.7 in unfunded liabilities. When you move it up to the FASB rules, it's $6.8 billion. And when you do something like a market valuation, I think it was 4.4% returns, that, that's $11.4 billion. And that shows you how sensitive these liabilities are to the discount rate assumption. That's shocking. It, it doubles the normal cost, which is the annual cost. Uh, to fund benefits for current and future hires from 10% to 25% of salary. Uh, because it was framed in this way, I think it, it sort of focused the minds of policymakers in the state that something needs to be done that's a little bit more aggressive than what we've seen in other places. And that included the passage of the, the um, Retirement Security Act of 2011, in which Rhode Island established a hybrid plan for all hires except, uh, for all employees except police. Uh, it also suspended the COLA until the system's 80% funded, increased the retirement age, and increased the contribution from most workers, although that did decrease for teachers. And that, by their estimates, reduces the unfunded liability by about $3 billion. Except as um, Joshua, note, Joshua Rao notes, uh, it's not enough when you consider what the numbers are when you do a market valuation. Now, what's going on in Rhode Island municipalities bears um, a lot of attention. And I put out a study last year that looked at what Rhode Island municipalities would look like if they discounted their liabilities using that market rate of return. The Rhode Island Auditor General already notes there's a huge problem. A report came out in 2011. Again, you can find it on the Treasury website. And I, I think your state's done a wonderful job of, of sort of doing these reports and, and focusing on the problem that of the 36 locally administered plans, 24 Rhode Island towns using the already high assumed returns of 75 and 8% are at risk. On a GASB basis, their unfunded liability is $2.1 billion. They are 40% funded on average, um, and that's, that's distressed. But on a market valuation basis, much more acute funding gaps emerge. And, and I have a table in my paper in which we calculated according to, I think the rate was about 3.6% when we did that. When you combined, this is what the localities uh, owe, but those that participate both in the state-run municipal plan and have their own local plan in some cases, these funding gaps uh, go up to about $6 billion across the municipalities of Rhode Island. There are some considerations for municipalities that are worried, um, and, and rightly so, about how they're going to deal with this unfunded liability. Most municipal pensions, unlike at the state level, are determined by a collective bargaining rather than statute. Localities don't require 100% funding. That's been a, sort of an institutional problem, and one thing that I've learned looking at pensions is how this market valuation problem touched off a series of behaviors in state and local plans over time. It was mentioned I'm from New Jersey. I actually first started looking at pensions through New Jersey's budget. It was clear to me New Jersey's pension system was a huge factor uh, in New Jersey's overall fiscal picture. 
And when you go back and look at behaviors, the choices that different administrations in New Jersey made over a series of 20 to 30 years to not fund the system, to skip contributions, in particular in years when the market was doing very well, to grant pension holidays, as they were known, to local governments, um, you, you see this kind of behavior, and, and that leads to deeper funding holes, of course. The localities in Rhode Island don't require 100% funding of the pension plans, the state does. And in fact, Moody singled out the, uh, the one town of Coventry uh, for its really poor record in funding its pension plan. Another behavior um, we've seen in some pension plans, and some states have been leaders in, in, in using this tactic, is the issuance of pension obligation bonds to fund the pension system. So you, you don't make the contribution, but you issue a bond to make that payment instead. Illinois has done this, California, Connecticut. Woonsocket issued a $90 million pension bond in 2003. And what they're doing is, is called arbitrage. They're betting that the investment returns on the asset side are going to be much better than the interest on the pension obligation bond. But you know, you're issuing debt on top of the, the fact that you've got an, un, an underfunded pension now. Uh, in 2010, their annual required um, contribution to the pension system was 2.7 million, and their debt service was then 1.7 million. But there are other constraints to consider when looking at um, the relationship between state and local governments. On the local level, they feel sometimes hamstrung because they have property tax caps. And in fact, in New Jersey, they uh, made sure as part of their, their sort of uh, fiscal relief in the past few years to make sure that property tax was capped because property taxes are very high in New Jersey. But that gives the local government um, less opportunity to, to fund the pension. And also then aid cuts factored in. Uh, after the recession, you had aid cuts from um, state governments to the local level, giving local governments less uh, resources. So why does the municipal level really, really matter? Is because when these costs rise, they can rise rather quickly, and that starts to crowd out spending on basic services, uh, police, fire, emergency services. Using government assumptions, the Auditor General of Rhode Island estimated that to fully fund pensions, on, using GASB assumptions, um, and OPEB, which are the health care benefits that, for the most part, are completely unfunded in the United States, they are on a pay-go basis, for the most part, um, would require 25% of the property tax levy. In certain localities, it's far more acute. It would require a far bigger portion. In Woonsock, it's 61%, Providence, 51%, and Johnston, 47%. Um, the proposal, your, your state government has, uh, is aware of, of the municipal problem and then of course the municipalities um, are and the proposal for municipal reforms offered so far are to require 100% funding of local plans to merge local plans into the municipal, the state run municipal plan and to eliminate any obstacles to doing so. Um, to take pensions and OPEB outside of collective bargaining and to, to ensure that these municipal reforms mirror what the state has done. So this is the progress to date. Um, the, the funding reforms passed take some of the funding pressure off of municipal governments. They're developing a toolkit. Um, and then uh, I know the, the state government is requesting that municipalities submit a plan uh, as to how they're going to deal with this by November. Uh, Providence, of course, went forward with some pension reforms this year and that uh, has saved them a, a little bit of money. Now, in contrast, Rhode Island to Pennsylvania, where I think it's an interesting story. Um, Pennsylvania has got a serious pension liability, but they're still in the talking stages. State level reform is being discussed. And as, as an example of, of you know, how serious this can be, they're assuming 7.5% returns on their assets. Returns this year were 3.4%. The state estimates in their two major pension systems, they've got a $40 billion unfunded liability. Um, they estimate, according to the state, that that will triple their contributions to the plan in the next three years, um, and that's going to be about 11.6% of their general fund. But on a market valuation basis, their unfunded liability is $116 billion. And this is a system, these, these two systems serve 800,000 employees. At the same time, they're, they're sort of putting the focus on municipal plans. As was mentioned, for whatever reason, uh, Pennsylvania has a lot of municipal plans, representing one quarter of them, uh, one quarter of municipal plans in the US. Interesting, the, interestingly, um, a, a healthy fraction of those only have about 10 workers. What you find is that the really big problems are concentrated in a few big cities. There's an overall $7 billion unfunded liability using GASB rules. 
And according to the Auditor General of Pennsylvania, 27 of these are severely distressed plans that are less than 50% funded. On a market valuation basis, that would be a lot more um, large. So these three cities of our particular concern, I highlight them today. Scranton, as you've probably seen, is, is broke. Um, they have an unfunded pension liability of $60 million and a budget of $75.5 million. Pittsburgh has a very large pension, pension liability relative to its budget, and Philadelphia has the largest. So as you can see, it's concentrated in a few major cities. Um, the consequences in Scranton. City officials cut salaries to minimum wage this year. Uh, there are similarities, and I want to highlight something else. In some of these cities where we've seen major um, problems and bankruptcies, they're, they're also related to other behaviors, the issuance of debt for certain projects. In Harrisburg, there was the incinerator project, for example. Scranton has also issued uh, large amounts of debt. Um, and it all, all sort of, you know, it, it goes into forming a really dire picture. They've got five and a half million interest on their debt payment um, in, in the this coming fiscal year. Pen Pennsylvania reform ideas and obstacles. What's being called for recently is why don't we merge the municipal plans into a state plan? And they're saying, look, we've got a lot of municipal plans. And I would say, yeah, yeah, you do, um, but you've got a few that are in really bad shape and you haven't really come up with a state plan yet. So one counter argument uh, that I've seen is, well, do you really want to merge all of these poor poorly some of these poorly funded plans into a state plan without a plan? Um, and by law, interestingly, Pennsylvania municipalities must offer a defined benefit plan. They may not offer a defined contribution plan, which gives them um, less um, room to maneuver. California is all over the road. Uh, the pension liability, as, as we just saw, is massive, and Los Angeles in particular. Um, some cities are, are attempting to tackle this. Uh, this year we saw pension reform in San Jose and San Diego with Proposition B, which is to move uh, new hires to a hybrid plan. And then we've also seen Stockton and San Bernardino go into bankruptcy. They participate in the CalPERS plan. And I, I found this really interesting, but um, San Bernardino is, is defaulting on its payment to CalPERS. CalPERS is charging them the, um, the payment based on a market valuation basis. And San Bernardino is calculating they owe the payment according to a GASB calculation. I find that curious. Um, and so some, some principles for reform. I think, again, Rhode Island got, got some principles right, uh, although, again, when you're looking at the numbers, they need to go further. First is truth in accounting. It's a numbers problem. Another place that called this an accounting issue, and I think um, braced themselves for reform, was the city of Atlanta. Um, once you get the numbers, you get a plan. And as has been mentioned, if you're going to guarantee something to the public sector worker, then you value it and fund it like you mean it. Uh, what's so disturbing when you look back at some of these pension systems is, is it's used as almost like a budgetary tactic. Should we make the payment this year? Shouldn't we? Um, the role of risk taking and, and gimmicks in some of these plans over time, it's again, over a, a period of years, decades even. Some principles for pension design is this idea of intergenerational fairness among the workers and uh, taxpayers. Among workers where you create a lot of tiers, uh, you, you know, the younger, you're asking younger workers to contribute a lot more than another cohort of workers. I don't think that breeds uh, comedy among, among workers. Um, and then, uh, of course, taxpayers, are you asking them, we want the next generation to pay for services that were rendered, you know, that you didn't even enjoy um, in the past, and then to pay on top of that for services and, and the pensions of these um, long retired workers. Also, the principle of choice and flexibility for employees. Um, not all employees are going to be in a, a public service job for the rest of for, for their entire career. They may want to move. They may want to take that retirement savings with them. So we are seeing a move towards hybrid plans in in many cases. Um, so, you know, going forward, you can have, you can imagine a menu of, of um, potential designs for retirement for public sector workers. And also this idea of shifting risk away from the government and taxpayer. If you like an annuity, maybe they shouldn't be managed by government. Maybe they should be managed by an outside entity. And that would take some of that, uh, what I would call public choice problems, um, out of the equation. Um, again, t I was going to highlight two cities to consider. Atlanta. Um, undertook some pension reforms, and now Philadelphia is actually looking to Atlanta as a model, although they, are, they do seem to be uh, bound by this, this idea. Atlanta created a hybrid plan for, for new hires, but Philadelphia may not be able to take that action if, if uh, Pennsylvania doesn't change its law. 
I would just conclude that this, uh, this is a great area to study from many possible angles. There is a financial story, there's economic behavior, there's fiscal and budgetary behavior and choices, um, legal and constitutional issues between state and local governments. Uh, Illinois, New York protect their benefits uh, in, constitution, in their constitutions and that's been a problem I think in Illinois. There's the government angle, issues of federalism, and um, also public policy and public administration. How do we design retirement benefits for public sector workers that uh, keeps people, uh, you know, get, um, attracts wor workers to the public sector, uh, but you know, how do we design that so it's sustainable and, and affordable? And these are some references. I really, um, you know, this is the work I've learned from, and um, I, I think some great work and some databases if you want to dig into uh, what's going on in Pennsylvania and, and in other places. Uh, thank you. Thank you.